This is Salma Schimmel for the group room at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Joining us now is Dr. Larry Norton, Deputy Physician-in-Chief for Breast Cancer Programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Medical Director of the Evelyn H. Lauder Breast Center, and Scientific Director of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Hello good, again, Dr. Norton. Good afternoon. Good to be here. One of the things I'd really like to talk about with you, Dr. Norton, is the speed at which oncology is changing now in the face of personalized medicine right. and understanding ever since the Human Genome Project, it's like, right. what a project, and it, we keep learning more. Right. And I want to try to grasp the past, the present, and the future from right. your point of view because with you, it's a unique opportunity because you can look back at medical oncology mm -hmm from different eyes. It's all changing very fast, and it's not just science that's changing quickly, society is changing quickly, healthcare delivery is changing dramatically, politics is in, is in evolution. We're at a period of great uncertainty. I think one of the greatest differences between when I got started is, and, and now, if you really think about, you know, when I came, you know, into, in, into the field, you know, coming out of the Eisenhower era, you know, going through the 60s, you know, into the 70s is, you know, we had a very clear notion of where we were going. We, we really knew what had to be done. Part of it was related to our confidence and we knew what cancer was, and therefore it was really, you know, n not that difficult a problem to what really figure it out. What did you think it was? Um, well, we, I, I want to get this. The, the, the important distinction is we didn't say then that we think this is what cancer is. We said we know what cancer is. We had enormous confidence uh, in, in what the present was for us in those days and where the future was, was uh, you know, was going and, and how, we could, how we could contribute to it. Um, the, uh, and if you really think about what was going on then, that, that sense of confidence was great security, but on the other hand, um, uh, you know, it, it didn't necessarily lay the groundwork for where we are now, which is great insecurity about where we are and where we're going. So, so you know, the picture was very simple. A cancer was that you, it, something's wrong with cell division. The cells are dividing too much. They pile up. When they pile up, uh, they eventually break out of their surroundings and go into the blood vessels and lymphatics. The ones that go into the lymphatics can get stopped in lymph nodes, and if they get stopped in lymph nodes, that's great. But if they break through those lymph nodes, they can get to the rest of the circulation. If they get to the rest of the circulation, they can eventually set up housekeeping in vital organs, and that was the problem. It was a very simple, linear kind of concept of cancer. And the ultimate problem was really the cells were dividing too much, because the tumor, the mass, was really the, was really the issue. Um, this really derived from the mechanics of the 19th century and the 18th century, the whole idea, notion of the steam engine. Uh, you know, the water boils, pulls up pressure, if it, it's got to come out somewhere, so it comes out in pistons, and then it turns wheels, and then good things happen therefrom. And a very simple kind of concept of, of, of linearity, linearity of thought, and linearity of, of, of concepts, and that, that, that went over into biology. And then, you know, then it was, then it was, you know, really, when I really got into it, it was really very easy. If we can operate and remove the tumor, you know, before it had broken out of its, its, uh, its setting, the, the capsule was holding it, and, and, to, and if it did get into the lymph nodes, we can take those lymph nodes out as well, you know, take it out in mass before it breaks out, you know, any further, then that would be the end of the problem. Um, and, uh, and so the question then, then was how do we find the tumors smaller um, so that we can find them at a time when they haven't really broken out of their housing and, and spread to the rest of the body? How can we do bigger surgery to, to, get, a, to get a bigger sample? We had very clear ideas of, of, of where to go. Um, and because all of this was accomplishable in academic centers, which were really rather modest, um, and as well, uh, you know, in practice settings, there was really no issue about where patients should be, should be taken care of. Uh, the best surgery is done by the best surgeons, and then there was a little mop-up action. I mean, I came in right at the ground floor of adjuvant chemotherapy. I mean, I was there at the National Cancer Institute when the very first trials from the NSAVP mm -hmm. were um, uh, starting to be presented, and, and I remember a very special presentation where they called us in and they said, listen, we have this data with this drug, LPAM, l phenylalanine mustard, young oncologists don't even know what that drug is, and mm -hmm. it's showing a real difference, you know. It, in subsets, it was showing a difference. It turned out that that subsetting was not accurate, and as you get more data that the subsets disappeared and it was helping everybody. Uh, you know, I was involved in oncology before the discovery of the estrogen receptor. The really big news was the estrogen receptor and targeted therapy on, on, on the base thereof. Uh, you know, Bill McGuire and Mark Lippmann was involved in that revolution, and there was an ex incredible excitement about that and the adjuvant use of hormonal therapies. Um, that really changed a lot of thinking because now we're starting to think of cancer as a systemic disease rather than as local disease, you know, pressure. Uh, people forget the, the, um, 
the, the Bernie Fisher revolution, uh, how he was championing the idea that you're not just dealing with a simple steam engine mechanics, linear mechanics, but rather dealing with a much more complex biological problems. And, and, and Gianni Bonadonna. It was a revolution, revolution of thought. Gianni Bonadonna involved in systemic adjuvant therapy, Vincent DeVita supporting those trials from the American National Cancer Institute to the Italian National Cancer Institute to be able to do those trials. And Better Veronese saying if it's really systemic, maybe we can get by with doing lumpectomies um, rather than big operations. Um, uh, the, the phrase that was used before that is lesser surgery is done by lesser surgeons. Um, and the whole idea of doing lesser surgery made you less you know, competent as a surgeon. There was, there was a lot of things that really happened then, but still it didn't change the underlying paradigm of you know, we know where we're going and let's just sort of so get there. The confidence with which we face the future then was really rather remarkable. Now we contrast that to where we are today because I, I think that fundamentally we know that a lot is happening. We know that there's a lot of information that's being gathered. Uh, we know that there's a lot of very important leads and we can identify them as important leads, but where it's all going is very uncertain. Would it be proper to say that in the 90s or so with the human genome, is that when mm -hmm. Things really began to accelerate. Yeah, well, that really started in the 50s, uh, you know, the mid 50s, with the discovery of DNA as the important as the important molecule for conveying the information and all the technology right. that, that that really derived therefrom. But the human genome project itself, and then with the identification yeah. of the BRCA mutation, is that sort of the it, time? It, it, when these were all points in a in a continuous process. You <laughs> know, I mean, uh, you know, America King had found a region where the where the gene was probably located. Um, and then it was just a matter of really hard work. In those days, very hard to find the gene. Now a whole lot easier, but in those days, very hard to find the gene. A lot of hard work to find that, that, that uh, you know, the spe specifics of that mutation and, re and, re and really what it meant. You know, the molecular revolution really happened with Watson and Crick, really. And, and, and then everything really sort of flowed logically from that with a lot of hard and creative work. A lot, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of creative people contributing to this. Um, but but n now it, it's not just, and I, I, and I think this is important to realize, it's not just science that's changed, and we'll sort of get back to that in a second, but it's also um, society has changed very dramatically. You know, we don't know where our society is going. You know, it was very, very simple before. I mean, I grew up in an era when, you know, pretty much everybody knew what was on the Ed Sullivan program, you know, and, and, and the hit parade. Everybody knew those songs. There was, it was much more of a cohesiveness, yes. you know, in the society before, and now it's like astonishingly fragmented. Um, uh, there's, if you look at the Billboard list of, you know, of, uh, you know, of, 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 of music, there's no one list of hits. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of them, depending upon the market that, that, that is listening to them. The people that are listening to hip hop don't have any idea what's happening in classical. People who listen to classical have no idea what's happening in jazz for the most part. And, and, and so the fragmentation of society in, the, in that way, whereas everybody knew Frank Sinatra, everybody knew per Perry Como. So that, so that, so that um, you know, we the, kind of the center has, has, has changed, and now there's there's many, many different kinds of centers. So society is changing very, very rapidly as well. Uh, healthcare economics is changing very rapidly, and and you know, and, and unquestionably, the need to make sure that everybody can get adequate medical care, you know, however we structure it, is something that's motivating, you know, the the entire transformation of the healthcare system. And obviously, people have many different political views about the best way to do it, but the goal is still very, very clear. But that's undergoing massive transformation. And the technology revolution, um, you know, really questions of how we can deliver this care. Um, can you still deliver it in a private setting? Uh, you know, is, is the doctor in the office with a secretary and one nurse, are they able to deliver this, this, this kind of level of care? So you're getting groups that are forming, private practice groups, and then groups of groups, and you've got the academic medical centers, which themselves are forming networks, which are, you know, the, which are closely linked to them, and then you're getting networks of networks. So that, so that we're just in a, in a revolutionary time, and it's not totally clear where the revolution is going. And, and that takes a special effort on the part of the people involved in it to make sure that with all this complexity, it moves in a positive direction. Thank you, Dr. Norton. This has been, a, for me, a huge privilege to spend time like this with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Larry Norton, Deputy Physician-in-Chief for Breast Cancer Programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Medical Director of the Evelyn H. Lauder Breast Center, and Scientific Director of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation.